Okay, good evening. Welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse 152, which reads as follows. Apasuta yang puriso bali bado jirati mangsani tasa wadhanti panya tasa navadati which means this man, this person who is of little learning grows old like an ox their flesh increases but their wisdom does not this was taught in regards to a specific elder when he was an elder because he'd been a monk for a long time but that was about it he wasn't an elder in any other sense of the word he hadn't reached any sort of higher wisdom or knowledge his name was Lalu Dai some of you might be familiar Lalu Lalu Dai and he always said the wrong thing when it was an occasion for giving a talk rejoicing in people's good deeds he would give a talk for a funeral talking about dealing with sorrow and when it was, it was a sorrowful occasion instead of helping people deal with the sorrow he would talk about joyful things how to rejoice in good things totally useless in fact whenever he gave a talk he would always say the wrong thing and the monk said you know, what use is there in bringing this guy anywhere He can't teach. Everything he says is wrong. He's always saying the wrong thing. And Buddha heard about it and said, Oh, this wasn't... It's not just in this life that Lalu Dai always said the wrong thing. He said this. He did this in his past lives as well. And the story goes that once there was this Brahmin. His name was Agidatta. And he had a son named Somadatta. And Somadatta was uh, Somadatta was wise. Somadatta was the bodhisattva in this past life story. Lalu Dai was his father. And they had two ox that they used, I guess, to plow their fields. And one day one of the ox oxen died. And the son said, "Well, you, know, you better uh, you better go and ask the king for another ox. See if you can get some help, because I guess you they they supported the king, or the king supported them. They somehow connected with the king. But the Brahmin asked his son to go and ask. And the son said, look, I can't ask. You know, I'm, How can I ask? I'm just a young boy. I'm just a son. His father was, of course, a simpleton, and the son was wise, so he was depending on his son to do it for him. And he said, look, all you got to do, you know, I'll teach you these verses. And he teaches him a verse, which is basically a request. He, he teaches him a speech. He has him prepare a sweet speech. And the speech goes... I had two oxen, mighty king, with which I plowed my field, but one of the two is dead. Pray give me another. Simple, right? Please give me another king. And the story goes that the Brahmin spent a year perfecting this. It's a little bit hard to believe, but he spent a long time memorizing this verse, preparing it. Okay, when he finally learned it by heart, the the boy said, okay, follow me and we'll bring a gift to the king and when we give him the gift, then you can recite the verse. You can recite your speech. Let him know that you need a new ox. So they get to the king. They give him the gift and he says, he, 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 
the king says, what, what, uh, what do you have need of? Let me know. What can I do for you? And the Brahmin says, I had two ox, oxen, mighty king, with which I plowed my field, but one of my two is dead. Please take the other, O king. And the king goes, what, what are you saying? Say it again. And he repeats it again, exactly, exactly the same. And the king looks at Somadatta and says, uh, Somadatta, I guess you've got a lot of oxen that you can spare. And Somadatta, being wise, he says, he, instead, of, instead of denying it, he says, Your Majesty, we have just as many as you've given us. And uh, the king, very pleased with him, ended up giving him 16 oxen and a bunch of other stuff. He was very pleased with Somadatta. So when they get home, it's not even in this story, but in the Jataka version, he, he asks him, he says, Look, you spent a year on this verse. Why why'd you mess it up? And uh, he has some weird logic that one should never presume to ask something from the king because... If he gets displeased, you can wind up in jail or, or with your head cut off or something. Anyway, it's just a silly little story. A very important verse, though. No? The, the bent of it is that the gist of it is that um, it's easy to become conceited about your age, about your seniority. I mean, this happens with monks a lot. Been a monk for a long time and you think of yourself as an elder, worthy of respect. Old people can be like this, maybe you're old. The Buddha wasn't, and you think, oh, somehow that I have life experience, right? life experience. It's true. The age should make you wiser, it does, but it doesn't always. So there's this qualifying factor that's required if you don't have it. You can be as old or as senior as, as you like, and you're not at all worthy of respect. And that quality is learning. Have you learned from life experiences? Have you learned from, from experiences? Have you learned anything? And so the worst sort of person is one who hasn't done any learning, who hasn't done even the most basic listening. They haven't gone to find wise people, they haven't asked questions, they haven't read books. Nowadays we have books with lots of things in, it, in them. And they haven't even done that much. And if they haven't even done that much, they're the worst of people. This is a person who's like an ox. They can be rich or powerful, and they can be old and venerate, ven uh, old anyway. They'd not be worth very much at all. Not have their life be worth anything. You might say they haven't lived, they've only survived. I think of before I found Buddhism, you know, before I had this inclination, I was seeking, you know, seeking out knowledge, but before, I, before finding teachings on wisdom, it's interesting how, I don't know what it's like now, but, but so many years ago, there was no inclination or there was no inkling of where wisdom was to be found. I thought wisdom was to be found in worldly studies. Maybe if I study philosophy, I'll find wisdom. So not even knowing, not even having the information is just the worst. If you never learn how to practice meditation, if you never have any instruction on how to pr practice meditation, 
You can never gain any sort of higher wisdom. It's the way of opening the door. For this reason, the tradition is very clear on the importance of study. You know, we often look down our noses at study thinking, hmm, you know, it's not real wisdom. Real wisdom comes from meditation. We see people who study a lot and they don't really know anything. Right? So Lalo Dai doesn't seem to be this first type. It seems like he has heard a lot. He can recite all these different uh, teachings. He just recites them at the wrong time. So there's something else missing. He's heard a lot, but he hasn't learned anything. And so the Buddha is clearly saying something different here. He's not saying this, the, a person who hasn't heard a lot. He's saying a person hasn't learned a lot. So there are other people who have learned a lot, learned much. They, they can remember and they can recite and they can even relate back much of the Buddha's teachings. They can teach other people how to meditate. They can give hour-long talks on the most difficult of subjects, reciting and repeating the Buddha's words, explaining the Buddha's words. But if they haven't actually learned them, and see, this is really what makes talking about teachers Looking at a teacher in particular, what makes a good teacher is not that they have lots of knowledge, but that they can apply it. So when we learn how to practice meditation, our ability to apply it is a whole other, is a whole other level of understanding. Some people, when they hear about meditation teachings, it's nonsensical to them. They can't really understand how to put it into practice, or maybe they don't put out effort. Or people who read the Satipatthana Sutta and without proper guidance and inclination, it's all just philosophy to them. And they might speculate about it or categorize it, put it in its place in their catalog of knowledge. But without an understanding of it, they can't really, un they can't really relate or explain or put it to any use. So the second type, I think this is the sort of person Lalu Dai was, was. He had lots of knowledge, but he didn't know what to do with it. He never taken the time to, or he didn't have the ability perhaps, to reflect deep, more deeply and understand what the meaning of the teachings actually was. But such a person is, even, even such a person who has understood the teachings and does understand how to put them into practice, of course that's still probably not, not, quite what, not quite what the Buddha was talking about still because such a person still doesn't have an understanding. You can't really say they've learned anything from the teachings. You know, per, the Buddha said a person who who studies a lot but doesn't put it into practice is like a person who looks after other people's cows. They never get the milk, they never get the products from the cows. They might get paid but they never get the fruit of the, of the labor. When you teach others it's great to watch them become enlightened but it doesn't say anything about your own state of enlightenment when you tell other people about Buddhism, teach other people, or, or pass the knowledge on. You can't really be said to have learned anything yourself. You're just acting like a parent. And so the, the, the most important aspect of any learning, any knowledge, is of course being able, actually putting it into practice. And the learning we get comes from application. This is what we call bhavana mayapanya. Wisdom that comes from mental development. And so for this, not a great amount of knowledge or information is needed. 
but an ability to uh, organize and then apply the teaching is all that's necessary. A person who has learned merely about the four foundations of mindfulness, if they're given enough information and able to process it well enough that they can put it into practice and gain much more learning than a person who has studied all of the Buddha's teachings, which is a considerable amount. I met a man once who had read all of the Buddhist teachings twice in Pali. His Pali was pretty good, and he still had the weirdest views. He had some, some very strange views. But it had to do with studying and not actually, not actually organizing it or, or really understanding it and learning nothing from it. He said, he admitted that he couldn't actually practice meditation. And so he denied that meditation had anything to do with becoming enlightened. He said, you just have to hear the Buddha's words and that's the only way to become enlightened. And somehow he got this from reading the Buddha's teaching. It was sort of evidence to me that study itself doesn't lead to practice, doesn't lead to wisdom and understanding. Our learning has to come from a deeper place. So the true learning that comes, that, that, that the Buddha is talking about here, it comes not from actually any knowledge whatsoever. You don't technically have to have heard anything from anyone. And all that words and instruction can do is help those of us who are lost come to, come to find reality come to see the, the nature of reality. We're not trying to gain any sort of philosophy or outlook or belief or, or knowledge even. We're trying to gain, what we're trying to gain is, wisdom, uh, is vision, what we call vipassana. Vipassana is a word we use instead of Instead of wisdom, you know, we don't often talk about panya so much as vipassana. And there's the reason for that is because it's not really a knowledge, it's a, a vision. It's not literally seeing with your eyes, but it's a experiencing, experiential wisdom. When you see for yourself that everything inside of you and in the world around you is impermanent, that everything inside you and the world around you is unsatisfying. And when you see that everything is non-self, that there is no control or, or, or ownership to be found. When you see for yourself that our attachments and our aversions and our delusions and our conceits and arrogances, that all of these are simply a cause for stress and suffering, that we hurt ourselves and bring ourselves uh, trouble and, and upset. And we can't blame, when we see that we can't blame suffering on the world around us or our experiences, but blame it on our own minds. <clears throat> and we learn, when we learn the ways in which we can rectify this, when we can, how we can learn to let go, learn to see clearly and objectively. when we change, when we open up, when we free ourselves from our own clinging, from our own bondage, when we realize Nibbana, when we experience this liberation that is free from suffering. That's what we mean by learning. So perhaps the best way to understand it is in stages. Of course, intellectual learning if, if the, of the right sort is important. Without it, as this verse says, wisdom can't grow. But even that sort of learning should be understood as, as insufficient. 
necessary but not sufficient. One must take one's knowledge, one's learning, and, and understand it, apply, and uh, organize it in one's mind, be able to put it into practice. What are the four foundations of mindfulness? What do they mean? What is their purpose? What is their use? How will I accomplish this? How do I do walking meditation? How sitting meditation? Organizing and um, implementing and then applying the, the, applying the teachings and really and truly practicing. Because that's of course the most rare. It's much easier to find people who know the teachings and who even maybe understand the teachings, but people who practice them, that's very rare. And among those who practice, it's even more rare for, to find those who practice wholeheartedly enough and, and intently enough to free themselves from suffering. Just one more thing we might say is this verse is, is a clear indication of the, the, the emphasis in Buddhism. That the emphasis is not in simply living. It's not in um, believing. That it, the emphasis is not even just in being a good person. The emphasis is on learning. The emphasis is on wisdom. With the idea that we can't force ourselves to be good people. We can't force ourselves to be free from from defilement. But with wisdom, goodness comes, what goodness follows. With wisdom, evil is eradicated simply through seeing clearly. So, there you go. That's the Dhammapada verse for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. Have a good night.